Well, good morning, Swickley Valley. What a privilege to be with you. It's always exciting for me when my dear friend, Pastor Scott McCabe, asks me to join you uh, to speak down here, whether it's just a quick interaction, whether it's to deliver a message. Always a privilege to be with you. I've got a lot of dear friends on this campus. I always thank you for your willingness to show up. Uh, I always thank you for your, your good questions, the questions you pose after sermons, the questions you pose in classes that I offer. Now, to this end, I'm really excited because beginning this Tuesday, you've all had one of these on your chair this morning, I'm going to start a new series here in, in Swickley Valley uh, at 7 o'clock Tuesday nights called Odd by God. This is a series that's going to focus in the Psalms. I, I shared earlier in the first service that the very first thing I ever taught on a graduate level was the Psalms. There's a love affair that I have with this book. It's just a passionate love affair I have with this book. This will not be your run-of-the-mill type Psalms class. Instead, I'm going to really seek to provide you with some additional handholds, some ways that you could really maximize your ability to read the Psalms and to understand this incredible book, incredible book and to leverage that knowledge with an ability to truly appreciate and be awed by God. Now, I understand as well that this is the vacation season. You know, it's, hey, it's a fact of life. But we, we don't die here in Swickley during the summer, right, Scott? We keep going. We cry, keep right on rolling. So we've designed this psalm series in a way to make it very user-friendly. So if you are only going to be available week one, week four, week seven, there isn't a week seven, week six, come. Because I am designing these so that each week stands by itself. Each week is independent. If there's something that you might need to know from week one, I'll cover it again in week four. But I'm not going to presume that you remember what we learned in week one and week four. Okay, so any week that you're available, let me encourage you to be with us. Let, us encu let me encourage you to join us. Uh, like I said, the Psalms is something that lights me up. Uh, I've always said, if you can't get excited about Scripture, what can you get excited about? And Scripture does it to me. And, and the Psalms is one of those in particular. So let me encourage you to join us. Uh, if that doesn't ring your bell, if that doesn't tickle your fancy, we've just started a new class in Wexford on Thursday nights as well. Uh, this is called Five Questions Every Christian Should Be Able to Answer. And they came up with a few good questions for me. This meets on Thursday nights from, uh, from 7 o'clock till 8.30. And the questions we've decided to focus upon are, how do I know the Bible is really true? If God is good, why is there so much evil? Does God really answer prayer? And then another one that's real hot right now. Uh, is Jesus really the only way to heaven? And finally, I'm not, I'm not sure I like the way this one is phrased. Who is the Holy Spirit? You see, that's based upon my, my belief that the Holy Spirit in many ways, when you talk about the Trinity, is an odd man out. He's the guy we don't talk about. He's the guy we don't understand. He's the guy we really don't spend much time with. So I'm going to really look to get into the question of, who is the Holy Spirit, and why is it important that we recognize and, and, and use the Holy Spirit in our lives? So don't be stagnant this summer. Take a chance. Take an opportunity to grow. I would welcome you to any one or, or two, even, of these series. If, you're, if you've got nothing else going, I obviously do. I've got a few things going this summer. Uh, I, I welcome you. I, I'd love to see you. This morning, we're going live on all our ca campuses at Northway. Uh, and again, I look forward to being able to bring the message here in Swickley Valley. We're going to continue our second portion of the Mark series, focusing upon the crowds. This was where really an ingenious uh, lens that Pastor Scott came up with during his sabbatical last year, Pastor Scott Stevens. Looking at the Gospel of Mark through the perspective of the religious leaders of the day, the crowds, and then we're going to take on the disciples. Three very different views, three very different perspectives on Jesus. Today we focus upon the last installment of the messages on the, on the crowds. So before we dig any further, before we go any longer, let's go to a word of prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for the privilege of delving into your word. We know, Lord, that when we come to your word and come to your word expectantly, you deliver. There's so much here to receive. There's so much here to assimilate. I've always said, Lord, that your word truly is the living word. 
It's not like Moby Dick. It's not like War and Peace. It's not like some other book that you can learn conceivably everything there is to learn about it. Lord, your word is full. Your word is living. Your word breathes with us. So, Lord, help us to resonate with your word and hear what your word has to speak to us this morning. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Expectations. Expectations. Now, depending on how you utilize this term, you can couch it negatively or positively. Expectations run the gamut of being minimal. You know, I really don't expect much in this situation. Or you could expect the universe. You could expect the most out of a given situation. Contemplate with me for a moment the spoiled kid. Spoiled child. We don't know any of those, do we? Contemplate with me the spoiled child that has never had to work a day in his life, that's always had things given to him. What is his level of expectation? Or what about the individual that has decided to surrender their lives to Jesus Christ, to live in step with Jesus Christ? What are their expectations? Earlier in this series, we previously heard about Luke chapter 8, verses 43 to 48, where a woman was encountered who was dealing with a bloody discharge for 12 years. She tried every doctor out there. She tried every cure possible, but nothing would cure her. And then she encountered Jesus. She snuck up behind him when he was in the midst of the crowd, grabbed a hold of the hem of his garment, and realizing that his power had gone from him, he turned to her looking for an explanation. And receiving an explanation, he said, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Reaching out, grabbing the hem of Jesus' garment. There was an expectation there. There was a clear sense of expectation, okay? On the negative side of the equation, you can reflect upon the story of Ananias and Sapphira. Remember them from the book of Acts? Ananias and Sapphira were a married couple who sold a piece of land and attempted to pull one over on the eyes of the church. They tried to look like they were giving all the proceeds to the church, but in actuality, they were actually becoming quite wealthy on the deal. So they were becoming wealthy on one hand, and they were assuming this position of looking real good. Well, that didn't wash, as we know. They expected Peter to applaud them, but were gravely mistaken. At the tail end of Acts 5.4, Peter says to Ananias, you have not lied to men, but to God. Ananias then collapses on the spot and dies. Enter Sapphira. No idea, no clue what happened with Ananias earlier. Peter says to her, How is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Then just as her husband before her, she fell down and died. Ananias and Sapphira had very poor expectations, and it cost them their lives. Some of you may know that I've just returned from a, from a journey to Greece with a Northway team. Uh, every two years, I lead a trip to, to either to Greece or to Israel, one of the great sites, one of the great pilgrimage sites uh, in, in the other, on the other side of the world. Uh, this was absolutely spectacular. What an incredible time. Uh, the last time I was in Greece, though, I can remember Pastor Scott Stevens taking me to lunch the week that I got back and saying to me, Jim, I want you to lead more trips. Twist my arm, right? Well, these are actually fairly demanding. It takes about two years to put one of these together. So every other year, we just, we just did Greece, and we're going to do Israel again in 2019. Uh, very quickly, we're, we're captioning it at this point, the med, the red, and the dead because we're planning to go to the Mediterranean Sea, the Dead Sea, and very good. You can catch on real quick. Okay, so there's also a modicum of awkwardness involved in doing this. Now, I'm flattered by this, but it's something I'm not comfortable with. The number of people that come up to me and say, you know what, it's on my bucket list to go to Israel, to go to Greece with you. 
I want to go to Israel or Greece, and I'm going because you're leading. But you know what my response usually is? Usually fairly flipped. I usually say, well, then you're going for the wrong reason. Well, if you're going expecting me to say something profound, you're liable to be sorely disappointed. You need to go expectant of what God is going to do. You need to be expectant of what God is going to do and how he is going to move in your life. He may have something he wants to teach you. He may have something he wants to instruct you in. Or he may want to move very powerfully in your life. So one of the things I preach to my groups before we leave, pray with expectation. Pray with eager anticipation for what God might want to do with you for you. And sometimes people come, will come back and it's not until they've been back a month, month and a half that they'll go, it was that. I missed it at the time. But if clear as a bell, this is what God wanted to teach me. God always shows up. God always shows up. I want to give you an illustration. My dear wife, Michelle, who can't be here with us today, she just had uh, re re reconstructive wrist surgery on Friday. And I'm her nurse. Good job I'm doing, right? <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> but she was praying expectantly for this trip. And she kept getting the sense of the wind. The wind. And she, I'm sure she told me about it, and I probably let it go in one ear and out the other. You know how the way husbands do that kind of thing, right? So she went to one of our dear friends, Amy Smith, who's part of the worship team. And, who, and Amy has a deep insight into spiritual things. They exchanged notes, and my wife, Shell, continued to seek, continued to try to understand what was the meaning of this idea of wind that she had clearly impressed upon her heart. Now, during the time that we were in Greece and also in Turkey, we encountered a number of times that we experienced the wind blowing. Nothing particularly significant, chasing your hat, doing things like that, but there was nothing particularly moving about it until the last day. The very last day, the very last site on our itinerary was Corinth. If you know anything about Corinth, Corinth was probably Paul's least favorite church. Paul would never say that, but it was his least favorite church. He had more trouble with this church than any other church. And you see it very quickly, very clearly when you read this letter. I decided kind of on the spur of the moment that I wanted to offer communion here at this site. Now, if you know anything about Corinthians, you might be saying to yourself, what's in his head? that he would be thinking to do communion at Corinth. Corinth was a place of sin. Corinth was a place of perversion. Corinth was not the place you would normally associate with a good place to do the Last Supper. But then I kept vying with God on this. And you know what I finally realized? The first gospel, probably Mark, was written somewhere around 66 to 70 A.D., 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians were written around 55, 56. So 10 to 12 years prior to the first gospel. Do you know what Paul teaches in 1 Corinthians 11? The Last Supper. The first place in Scripture where the early church was taught about the Last Supper is from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. So it seemed appropriate as we sat there among the trees with the temple to Apollos in the background and all the other ruins around us. We, we sat there and we reflected on 1 Corinthians 11, 17 to 34, as we distributed the elements of bread and wine. And as we were partaking of the bread and wine, there was such a very distinctive whoosh, movement of the spirit, movement of the wind around us, and through us, we were all just blown away because it's my belief that we were honored at that time and in that place by a manifestation of our Lord's Holy Spirit. It was just an, an incredibly moving situation. I can't tell you how many people that were with us said that was their most meaningful time of the entire trip, almost 14 days. Do you remember in Acts chapter 2 when the Holy Spirit descends upon the church, what happened? 
It came through like a rushing wind. It's not coincidental that whether you're looking at the Old Testament or the New Testament, looking at the word ruach in Hebrew or, or pneuma in Greek, the word spirit is also the word for wind. So the fact that the spirit would come in the form of the wind, it's not a big surprise. We had a reward for waiting. And that was the palpable presence of God's spirit. Expectant waiting for God to show up. God will deliver. Expectations, however, can have a dark side. Indeed, poor and wrong expectations can devastate us, trap us, and place us in cycles of helplessness and despair. There's a book called The Devil's Dictionary that I like quite a bit. It's by a man by the name of Ambrose Bierce. Bierce was a Civil War, Civil War soldier, and after he resigned his position uh, as a soldier, he began to write for a number of newspapers and edit for a number of newspapers in San Francisco. Bierce is a humorist. Some would consider him a humorist. But his definition of expectations really grabbed my attention. It says, the state or condition of mind, which in the procession of human emotions is preceded by hope, and followed by despair. Many of us may be able to commiserate with Mr. Bierce's definition of expectation. For there surely is a sense in which we have seen expectations go for naught. We have seen expectations not come to fruition as we would expect them to. But lack of expectation can rob. Lack of expectation can paralyze. Three points I want to make here. Number one, wrong expectations lead to missed opportunities. If our expectations are not congruent with those of God, we can re regrettably take stock of the fact that such ill-founded expectations will ultimately lead to missed opportunities. The author of Proverbs puts it this way, where there is no vision, the people cast off restraint. If there is no revelation from God, if there is no abiding sense of expectation, people can expect spiritual and physical anarchy. Secondly, wrong expectations can blind us to what's actually happening. We can become so jaded and simply miss, or at least misunderstand what God is trying to do. Finally, Wrong expectations are oftentimes reinforced by groups. Wrong expectations are oftentimes reinforced by groups. Have you ever heard the expression groupthink? Some of you have heard of it, some of you are nodding yes. Groupthink was coined in 1952 by a man by the name of William White in Fortune magazine. And he defined it like this. He said, groupthink, being a coinage and admittedly a loaded one, a working definition is in order. We are not talking about mere instinctive, instinctive conformity. It is, after all, a perennial failing of mankind. What we are talking about is rationalized conformity, an open, articulate philosophy which holds that group values are, that are not only expedient, but are right and good as well. The thing about wrong expectations is that they're oftentimes reinforced by the crowd and oftentimes the result of groupthink where indeed our best interests are not kept in mind. Think of Jesus on the cross. We're going to talk about this passage in a moment. But Mark chapter 15. Here's Jesus on the cross and all these passers-by are looking at him and they're saying, you did not destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Uniformly. You did not rebuild, destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. You didn't live up to what we expected you to do. You know, we, talked off, we talk oftentimes about being created in the image of God, but I think there's a bigger problem. I think the bigger problem is that we try to create God in our image. We try to make God what we believe God should be. We try to make God to be the most acceptable character for us rather than letting God be God. Consider what the crowd is telling young people today. That it's good and completely normal to live together before you're married. Something that is largely best on, based on pleasure and financial reasons. The crowd is not telling them what the National Institute of Child Health and Development 
is telling them. Number one, living together is considered to be more stressful than being married. Secondly, just over 50% of first cohabiting couples ever get married. Third, in the United States, couples who live together are at a greater risk for divorce than non-cohabiting couples. And fourth, couples who live together before marriage tend to divorce early in their marriage. But the crowd says it's a good idea. The crowd says that we should embrace it. The crowd says it's the way to go. Group thing. Group thing. Let's come back to the scripture that I promised. Perhaps nowhere do these notions of wrong expectations come to roost more clearly or as strongly as in Mark chapter 15, verses 21 to 32. And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they brought him to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him read, King of the Jews. And with him, they crucified two robbers, one on his right, one on his left. And those who passed by deriding him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Save yourself. Come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. Now let's let's understand crucifixion here. Crucifixion and the brutality associated with it were not reserved to be experienced and seen by a select few. They were as public as public could be. When Jesus is hung on the cross, crowds would have constantly passed by him and seen him up there. This was a public spectacle. To illustrate the public nature of it, I want to give you a a very, very brief anecdote from the Jewish historian Josephus. Josephus lived contemporarily with Christ. Uh, He says, And when I was sent by Titus Caesar with Cyrillinus and a thousand horsemen to a certain village called Thekoa, in order to know whether it was a place fit for a camp, as I came back, I saw many captives crucified. And I remembered three of them as my former acquaintances. I was very sorry at this in my mind and went with tears in my eyes to Titus and told him of them. So he immediately commanded them to be taken down and to have the greatest care taken of them in order to their recovery. Yet two of them died under the physician's hands while the third recovered. Imagine. You know, the the place of crucifixion, clearly, according to the Gospel of John, would have been outside of the city. Okay? Wouldn't have been inside the city. But in order to get to the city, you have had to pass it. Probably each and every day, there would be new people added to the crosses along the way. People accused of things that might be accurate, things that weren't. Crucifixion was part of public eye, part of daily life. So... If we come back then to Mark 15, I want you to keep in mind Psalm 22 with these very, very deeply messianic words. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. This is 1,000 years before Jesus walked this earth. The downer of the book Lamentations, chapter 2, verse 15 says, all who pass along the way clap their hands at you. They hiss and wag their heads at the daughter of Jerusalem. Is this the city that was called the perfection of beauty, the joy of all the earth? They deride him. They mock him. Why, pray tell, do they do this? Again, taking our cue from Mark 15, we read, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself, come down from the cross. Because their expectations were wrong. Okay, this is important because their expectations were wrong. They missed salvation. They missed the one, the only opening, 
means of salvation. We are among the passers-by, the crowd who mocked and jeered, witnesses the Christ's trusting relinquishing of his life to the Father. In the prior installment of the Mark series, we focus upon the religious authorities and their reactions to and dealings with Jesus. Over the last week, we have contemplated Mark's focus upon the crowds, looking at Jesus' life through the eyes of the crowds. In our next and final installment of Mark, we'll turn our attention to those who were closest to Jesus, his disciples. However, an interim assessment, which is both prospective and retrospective, might be very appropriate at this juncture. Are we partially to be seen as among the religious authorities? Or are we partially members of the crowd? Or might we be among the disciples? I think we're a smattering of all three. We are partly the empire and its soldiers, recognizing who he was, but too late. We are partly the crowd, shrinking away in cowardice, but after we have contributed to nailing him to the cross. And finally, we are among his followers, bewildered by his death, moved by his courage and freedom. The passers-by were more interested in deriding Jesus than assessing Jesus. Some of those who flapped their gums that day no doubt had seen Jesus previously. I mean, they were aware of this statement that Jesus had made. Undoubtedly, some of them had witnessed miracles. Undoubtedly, some of them had witnessed exorcisms. Undoubtedly, undoubtedly, many of them had witnessed Jesus at his finest teaching the crowds. But look what they were reduced to at this point. They were reduced to that one thing that they didn't understand. They said, look, you didn't do this. Once again, are we created in the image of God? Or are we creating God in our image? Again, wrong expectations lead to missed opportunities. Wrong expectations blind us to what's really happening. And wrong expectations are reinforced by crowds. So who was this Jesus? How are we to take stock of this Jesus who died this brutal death on a cross at Calvary? In the mid-19th century, a Scottish Christian preacher by the name of John Duncan formulated what he called the trilemma. Some of you may have heard this before because it was popularized by C.S. Lewis. It's been popularized by Josh McDowell, the famous uh, Christian apologist. He asked the question, Jesus either deceive mankind by conscious fraud, or he was himself deluded and self-deceived, or he was divine. There's no getting out of this. All of us have got to come to grips with exactly who Jesus is. Liar, lunatic, or Lord. Was he a liar if Jesus made his claims knowing he wasn't God? Then it was lying to his followers. And consider the absurdity of it. Not only did he lie about it, he died for it. If that doesn't make a liar, a lunatic, I don't know what does. If someone told you he was God, you would probably believe him as much as believing he was Santa Claus. You would call him a deluded, self-deceived dude. Yet Jesus didn't display the abnormalities and the imbalance that usually go hand in hand with a crazy. Jesus was a guy who spoke some of the most profound words ever recorded. Words that have set many free and even some in mental bondage. Jesus was no lunatic. Was he Lord? If Christ isn't liar or lunatic, you only have one option. He is Lord. One of the famous quotes that I remember from, from years ago I read it in a theology book back in 1975. I mean, it sticks in my mind like it was yesterday. It makes a statement, Buddha's tomb is occupied. Confucius' tomb is occupied. Muhammad's tomb is occupied. Christ's tomb is empty. Folks, we live in the light of that crucifixion event and the subsequent resurrection that Jesus pulled off. Nobody else pulled that off. Nobody else in history has pulled that off. 
No other God or holy man in history has pulled that off. Only our Lord, Jesus Christ. So was he a liar? Was he a lunatic? Or was he a Lord? You have to make the choice. You have two resources to help you make the correct decision. One is the historically credible record of Christ rising from the dead. And second is the Bible, which gives you solid reasons to believe. A huge reason. God gave you this book. As John writes, John chapter 20, verse 31. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Imagine you were there that day. Imagine you saw Jesus hanging on that cross. Do you think you would have fallen in with a crowd and derided him for what he hadn't done, at least in your assessment, what he hadn't done? Or would you have had the courage to stand up and say that this is my God? You see, folks, the crucifixion and then finally the resurrection are the core of our Christian faith. You can embrace every other miracle. You can embrace every other great thing that Jesus did. But if you don't embrace the resurrection, this is meaningless. Completely meaningless. Because if we don't have the core miracle of the Christian faith, everything is for naught. I don't happen to believe that's the case. I've staked my life on it. Where are you? As we pull this in for a landing, I want to take us back to where I started today. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul gives the first instruction to the Christian church about the celebration of the Lord's Supper. So please allow me, if you would, to read briefly from a portion of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. If I can find it. He starts the passage, this is 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting at verse 17. Starts the passage deriding the Corinthians for the divisions, for the problems that have arisen in the church. And then he says this, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty the body and blood of the Lord. So let a person examine himself then and eat of the bread and drink with the cup of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning, the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. I'd like to take a moment here and ask us to go to prayer. And I'd ask you just quietly, in the quietness of this moment, he talks very, very clearly about the need that we make a clean breast of things, that we have sought forgiveness, that we approach the Lord's table, table with a clean slate. Before you approach the Lord's table this morning, what do you have to lay before him? So after a few moments, I'll, I'll close in prayer. So let's pray. Father, what are we without you? 
miserable sinners, miserable wretches with absolutely no hope, but only because of what you have done, only because of what you accomplished by willingly going to Calvary, sacrificing your son on that cross and raising him from the dead. Lord, that's the only thing, the only thing that gives us hope in this world in which we live. The realization that you, Lord Jesus, are alive. And we celebrate that at this moment, at this time, in the name of that precious one, Jesus Christ. Amen. Ushers, you want to come forward. It's always struck me interesting, the, uh, the verbiage, the verbiage, if you will, of the institution of the Lord's Supper. Because depending on what church you've been to, you might find it differs from place to place. Sometimes it will simply say, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Other times we will say, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This is something I've thought about quite a bit. Because when you think about it, when you really think about it, I think the second statement is actually inaccurate. Because was Jesus technically broken? No. Because had he been broken, he would not have been a viable sacrifice. Do you realize that? When Jesus is on that cross with the two thieves at his side, the Roman commander gives the command to break the legs of these men on the cross to bring about their death that much faster. So they break the legs of the first thief. They break the legs of the second thief. And what happens when they come to Jesus? Jesus is already dead. This is because Jesus was our Passover lamb. Jesus was, was, the, was the only perfect, without blemish, spotless sacrifice that could possibly take away the sin of all mankind, past, present, and future. In Exodus, we learned of the lamb. And with the lamb, you didn't sacrifice the one that was limping around the pen and probably wouldn't make it till the next day. You offered the best, the best of the best. Folks, Jesus Christ was the best of the best. Don't ever think that on that day, the Romans took Jesus' life. Jesus willingly surrendered his life. So taking the bread at supper, he broke it and said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me, the body of Christ. Paul goes on to tell us through 1 Corinthians 11 that after supper, he took the cup, said this cup represents the new covenant in my blood. You see, if you know anything about a covenant in the Old Testament world, it always required blood. It always required that blood be shed to ensure it, to make it sure, certain. Jesus Christ was the only one, the only one, who could seal this deal, the only one who could seal this covenant. So we drink from this cup in remembrance of him.
Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you loved us so much that you express that love in a way that we just still today can barely fathom by taking your son, your only son, and placing him on that cross at Calvary. As your people this morning, Lord, we celebrate anew that Easter miracle, that it didn't stop there, that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And Lord, we live and have the promise of life because of that incredible resurrection. So Lord, we bless you, we praise you, and we love you. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ, amen.